Yes. All right, so welcome back to Night Hacking Interviews at the JCreate Unconference. So I'm here with Peter Lowry. Um, and how are you? How are you enjoying the beautiful weather here? Uh, it's lovely. The <laughs> swimming's great. The beach this morning is fantastic. Um, nice. Um, so speaking of the beach, I, I was party to a whole bunch of geek discussions at the beach. So give me give me an example of one of your one of your geeky chats you had. Uh, we were talking about um, whether trans how, how important transactions are in databases and data stores. And uh, we... Was that, was that edging on a big data conversation? It, more a fast data conversation. So okay. um, in fast data, obviously, if you, um, the more transactionality the support you put in, that, that adds... slows stuff down. Slows stuff down. So how, how much are you willing to compromise to get speed um, in, in terms of transactions? Uh, yep. And particularly, it, like, if, if you've got just key value transactionality, like for a single element, is that really a transaction or just <laughs> kind of like a minimum? Yeah, no, at that level, you're probably not capturing an entire transaction. So if you had to roll back, you actually wouldn't get to a consistent state. Yeah, exactly. Because a lot of the time, you're dealing with multi-value. Yeah, OK, very interesting. Did you come to a conclusion, or you just kind of <laughs> well, we, I think we came to the conclusion that um, a, a single entry is kind of pretty minimal, but when most people talk about a need for transactions, they're talking about you know, multiple well, Longer entries. running, multiple, yeah. multiple different data points and possibly different documents or stores. Exactly. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, and then we've had a bunch of, I think we did the first set of JCrete unconference sessions just now. Which one were you in? Uh, the previous one was on the hardware performance counters and okay. um, how you can access them via a JNI library and had some interesting examples of showing how you can see cache misses and branch prediction misses that you're getting for different types of code. And um, in particular, you gave an example where you, you might think there's branch misses, but um, showed that you don't get them and why by looking at the assembly. Hmm. Interesting. I know one of the guys here, I forget his name, he has a one of the Londoners has a tool for showing um, code, and then it shows you the byte code and the assembly, and then the, uh, the logs analyzes watch, the logs. Yeah, JITWatch. Yes, that's a very cool tool. I, I haven't used it enough, I think. OK, but it sounds like it's very pertinent to the discussion you guys were having about um, caching and exactly. misses and all that stuff. Yes, because that, that can be very good to explain why um, there isn't a branch when you think there might be. Yeah, yeah. Just, just so are you going to say something about JitWatch? Kirk? Kirk is in the official heckling yeah, squad Chris over is, there. Yeah, uh, Chris's JitWatch is an excellent, uh, we call it educational tool for uh, getting people to understand exactly what the JVM is doing underneath the covers. Um, nice. It really makes a lot of that information accessible, I think. Yeah, he's done a wonderful job putting that together. Yes, okay. yeah, it's an excellent product. Very cool. And I know, I know we were trying to hook up in Java land and it didn't quite work out. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, well, we should probably pick up on that conversation as well. Yes. Uh, yeah, well, I, at the time I was looking to talk about um, uh, an open source product I've got called Chronicle. Mm -hmm. And uh, in particular, it um, acts as a journal or a queue or a log. And what makes it different from a lot of other products is it's designed to be around a microsecond. Oh, when, wow. when you consider that's persistence and sharing between processes, that's quite fast. And the other thing that's particularly interesting about it from my perspective is it breaks the model that um, if you want to go fast, you have to go off disk and into memory. Mm -hmm. uh, but what this can do is it can give you memory speed, but have it lazily. Obviously, it's not synchronously written to disk, but asynchronously written to disk. And so you, you get some degree, best of both worlds. Cool. Yeah, I think that also gets on part of the discussion you're having about um, how much you care about consistency of stuff to get That's more speed. Right. Yeah, so in that, that case, you, you, um, you have the option of writing to disk, uh, flushing, forcing it to flush to disk, but mm -hmm. at that point, you're limited by your hardware the speed yeah. of your hardware. Yeah. But uh, if that's not required for every message, or for, in fact, for any message, then you can get you, much faster performance. You can get a lot faster performance. You can get um, between 3 and 20 million messages a second. Wow. And this is um, an unbounded queue. 
So do you, do you like does like um, faster performance hard drives like SSDs and things help with? It does. Um, it helps it's, with it's still sustained the, okay. bursts. So, uh, for example, if you have a normal hard drive, you can write uh, sustained about 40 to 60 megabytes a second. Got so it. if you get this massive burst of messages, and then you allow it to drain, and then you get another burst, and you allow it to drain, an ordinary hard drive is quite capable. Okay. Reality is that that doesn't happen consistently. It's, it's, a, it's unusual to have that type of pattern all the time. There will be occasions where you just have bigger bursts. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, if you have SSDs, a lot of those issues go away. Um, you can have SSDs. Um, yeah, I think they go up to like 300 or 600. Yeah, you can, you can eas reasonably easily get about 400 megabytes a second write speed and um, okay. 500 plus for read. But it's the writes that are going to kill you. Yeah. What you can do also is you can stripe them. So, um, okay, yeah, yeah. So SSDs in a RAID, and then you can get even yeah. faster write performance in a cluster. That's exactly it. So with um, six of them striped together, I've got 2.35 gigabytes a <laughs> second write speed. OK, so in that case, your hardware is not the limiting factor anymore. <laughs> exactly. So, you, you so, so, so Kirk looks like he's, he wants to yeah, jump in. Yeah, I want to jump in, because I think there's, <laughs> an, there's an excellent use case for Chronicle that, uh, uh, that, it, that you're neglecting to talk about, and that's just uh, straight logging. And yes. the advantages of Chronicle over the uh, traditional uh, loggers that um, applications have been, um, shall we say, saddled with. Yes. Um, uh, one of the things that it attempts to do, because it's, uh, it's, it's designed to be very low latency, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that it is key to its design, apart from blockless coding, is also GSIL-less coding. So you can write to this logger without creating any objects. Oh, nice. And in fact, um, we've got now adapters for um, uh, a number of the standard loggers. Don't say this. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they can also can be used in a way that doesn't create objects as well. Nice, uh, nice. What's particularly useful about this is it's not only designed to be logging out. You, you want to have a chat about loggers later, Kirk? You can, oh, I forget. <laughs> yeah. it, it, not, it not only writes out the data, but it's designed to be read in machine read in, in high speed as well. And this is uh, the, the low latency use case. So you, uh, between when you write a message and when you read a message is sub microsecond. And in nice. fact, it's around 300 nanoseconds. Um, and so, uh, but to achieve that, you need to have both a reader and a writer. And once you've got that reader, you actually have a means of reading your data and manipulating it and analyzing it, monitoring your application mm -hmm. as it's going on, but also recording production inputs, not just the occasional production input that's got a bit of logging that gives you an idea of what it was doing, but in fact, you can record the entire, the entire input and yeah. entire output. And now you've got reproducible, replayable, deterministic system. Nice. So you can take, say, a day or even a week's worth of logs. And then you could replay that into, into the system. And then yeah. show that a rare bug that you got once or twice a day uh, is reproducible in test and then is fixed when you actually change it. Uh, the original motivation was to find those rare performance issues that are very got hard it. to reproduce in a synthetic Yeah, so like for those performance issues, you'd not only need the data, but you need the timing and the speed they're being input in the system and like the haul. Yes, everything yeah. that led up to that, like yeah. how many, how much garbage did right, you right, Kirk's, Kirk's jumping in here again. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to say that, I mean, the, 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 I mean, the amazing thing that, that Java Chronicle, sh or J Chronicle shows is that, um, that we actually pre-filtering messages slows you down. And that's, that's, uh, I think that's an amazing point uh, about the, maybe you want to address that a bit more. Yeah, it, it slows you down um, because, uh, uh, well, for, for a couple of reasons. One is that um, if you end up with a pre-filtered log, this mm -hmm. is usually in addition to the work that the application already has to do. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to pass information between threads, and then you say, well, what did I pass between these threads? I'll, I'll log this as well. Yeah. Uh, what you find is that if you use Chronicle to do this, you're passing all the information between the threads, but you also have a complete record of that. So you're actually only writing it once. You're only actually reading it once. Oh, just but a sec. Let me do a little tweak. Uh, there. Yes. Okay. Sorry. 
So you're only reading it once, and um, by uh, avoiding adding any extra logic to do the filtering up front, mm -hmm. you um, avoid the risk that you're going to miss something you'll use need later because, in fact, you have every input that you needed at the time to run the application and therefore every input you needed later. But also um, you have that less extra work at the time of development to say, well, these are the messages I'm interested in having to decide what am I going to include, what, I, what am I going to have to cull for performance reasons. And um, you don't have that overhead as well of doing the decision at the time, you can do it later. Cool. Uh, and because it's an unbounded queue, your consumers can be any amount behind your producer. So it can be an offline overnight analysis. It can yeah, be well, you need quite a lot of memory probably in that case. So. Well, uh, you, yes, it depends on how big your bursts are, yeah. right? Because it's be, actually, it's, it's memory map files. Okay. So it's being streamed out oh, discontinuously. Okay. Yeah. So yes, you may need a lot of disk space, but this terabyte is cheap. It's cheap. Um, the um, three terabyte SSDs I bought cost under two grand, uh, two thousand dollars. Yeah. Um, and uh, so even even SSDs are coming down. Uh, so you can um, stream it out to disk, and so the amount of memory, the default behavior is that five percent of your um, memory, between five and ten percent of your memory, is reserved for um, disk uh, dirty writes. Mm -hmm. So if you get a burst that's, say, 10% of your main memory size, then that will just fill up a buffer. Once you hit the 10%, it will actually stop the application writing any more data to memory until those pages go out, and that's when you hit a problem. Mm -hmm. um, you can tune it up to about 30%, but it's usually, the default is usually enough. If you've got, say, a 64 gigabyte server, you can actually take six gigabytes of uh, writes ahead of what's on disk, which is quite a lot, uh, before you run into an issue at all. Yeah, it's not so, bad. No, so yeah, so you get these, it can handle quite high bursts. So, so are there any um, examples of Chronicle being used in large systems or places yeah. they've been effectively using it for performance tuning their apps? Yes, uh, we have um, two main uses, uh, two main products was Q and Map. So the Q is used uh, in uh, a number of trading systems okay. because you want to record um, not only all the market data coming in but all yeah. the responses that are yeah. good. And uh, we have one client that's replicating it between two boxes. Um, server A replicates to server B. Server B responds. Server B sends a response back to A. A actually deals with the client and sends that response. The 99th percentile round trip is 25 microseconds. Wow. And when you're considering it's got two network hops and uh, four persisted messages in that, <laughs> that's pretty low. And it's, it's GC list. Right, so you can run millions of messages through the system. And yet you won't have any pauses or no, delays. No, delays. because it's not even a minor collection. Yeah. Right? So it's not only do we avoid the major collections, we avoid having any minor collections. Um, their system is probably more tuned than entirely necessary. <laughs> and the reason I say that is that they can actually run for a week without um, a GC pause. <laughs> which it has the irony is that they have a company policy of restarting every day. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's why it's probably overtuned. That's funny. Um, I have another client. Um, is well, they could get seven times the volume before they have to worry about. Exactly, <laughs> or they add things into the code that yeah. <laughs> create a bit of garbage. So, um, so yeah, so we, another client we have is um, use the shared map because shared map allows you to work like a concurrent hash map, except it's both persisted and shared between processes. Mm -hmm. So you can um, have multiple JVMs looking at the same map. You can have another JVM come up, look at what that map is doing, and it's actually embedded in every machine. So unlike something like, say, Redis, which is an in-memory database, um, Redis has to go via TCP. So you've got mm. that TCP hop, which is at least two microseconds even over loopback to yeah. do anything. Yeah. Um, whereas uh, this can do, um, uh, you can write to a data with, with a CAS operation, and you can pick that up in another process in 40 nanoseconds Wow. in Java. right? Um, and uh, the, re the reason why it works particularly well for this client's use case is they have 80 JVMs, and they need to share 50 gigabytes between them. Now, obviously, if you replicate the data into in memory on e each one of these JVMs, there's four terabytes, mm -hmm. right? And you have to send it around to each one. Or you could have just one copy in memory, and when you write it, it just goes straight into memory. 
um, they actually, um, one of the problems they found with using it is that previously their logs came up in a rate that they could read them. <laughs> and um, after putting this in, um, they could no longer read their logs anymore. That's, that's a good problem. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So they, they were kind of pleased uh, with that. They uh, sent we, got another, we got another heckle commenter here. Uh, yeah, I have to say that I, I used uh, GC logs that Peter's provided me with as examples of well-tuned applications and, and well-tuned <laughs> garbage collectors. Nice. Uh, his, uh, his GC logs come out very, very clean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, um, interestingly enough, I actually uh, I worked on um, th th on the topic of off heap. I worked on a, um, uh, a, a Minecraft server. Mm -hmm. and my son is nine years old, and he's really into Minecraft. Oh, nice. And being Java and a Java performance guy, yeah, I, I like, did oh. some tuning of it and uh, found that eighty percent of all of the objects within the system were byte arrays. And of course, that's <laughs> trivial to move a byte array off heap. And so by just using byte buffers and tuning another caching library, um, actually used um, Sensum to show that the, uh, the heap behavior before and after, just by doing that, mm -hmm. was dramatically different. Wow. And also the pause times the application itself reported were dropped dramatically by more than an order. Is so on the client or the server side? You're this hacking? is all entirely on the server side. I okay. haven't tried playing with the client yet. But. Yeah, the problem with the client is it's closed source. The servers are, mm. well, some of them are open source. You can actually hack them. You can actually hack them in the sense that the code is obfuscated, but of course you can decompile it. Yeah, but buck and Bucket's actually open source. Yeah, Bucket is open source, but what they do is they take some of the classes, decompile them themselves, and then uh, add in things that call that. So it. they act as a, an open source bridge to an, a closed source a library. Got it. So they, they actually keep their changes to a minimum so that they can just keep plugging in newer versions of a library they've got no access to, which is interesting, actually, <laughs> trying to work with a Try, how, do you Close, how do you optimize your application when you're sitting on top of a closed source library you <laughs> decompile? Exactly. So That's funny. So it took me a little while to s figure out. It took me half a day to figure out how to migrate it from byte arrays to byte nice. buffers. Have you contributed any changes back? Uh, yeah, I've contributed those two changes, and um, that's actually been deployed quite a lot of it. Ironically, out of all the work that I've done, that's that piece has been deployed to more servers than anything else I've done. That's funny. <laughs> Something I did in half a day. All right, cool. I think we should move on to the next interview. Do you want to get the last word, Kirk, as our official heckler? No? Yes? Nah. Yes. All right. Nah. Very good. Thanks. Peter said all. All right, thanks very much, Peter. Pleasure. Enjoy the next set of sessions. Thank you.